Hallelujah. Would you clap your hands to the Lord tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I feel a great flow of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Before you're seated, if you're not a germaphobe, I want you to turn around and give someone a big hug. If you're a germaphobe, just give them a big smile. If you brush your teeth, if you didn't brush your teeth, I guess a thumbs up will work. I see a few people hugging nobody. I'll know who to put my mask on around. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. When you get back to your seats, would you grab your Bible? Grab your Bible. And uh, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Amen. Thank you all of you came out tonight. I believe the Lord has something special. It was great to see a lot of you men uh, on Sunday night for our eight-week Bible study, Vessels of Honor. Uh, that graphic that was made was pretty sick, man. And uh, I want to give credit to Brother Hernandez. I know he doesn't get a lot of credit for that. And uh, he made a pretty sick graphic, and uh, it's been great. I want to invite you, if you have not been there, um, I want you to be there. It's going to be great. Ladies, I'm not a Give God Eight, so I don't... It'd be weird if I was. So I don't know... Uh, I don't know who was there or not, but I know it's going to be a wonderful time. Any time that we spend in time, any time we spend in unity, in studying the word of God, that's a good formula for a move of God. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter four, starting with verse seven. Passage reads as follows. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about guarding the treasure. Guarding the treasure. Would you uh, put your Bibles down? Uh, just where you're seated. Just slip a hand up to heaven. I said God would speak to you tonight. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, God. I thank you for this wonderful group that is assembled in this gymnasium, Lord. God, I could feel their hunger. I could feel their, their, their desire. And God, I pray that faith would be increased. Lord, I pray that there would be a flow of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I pray that there would be a flow of the touch of God. Let the word of God find good soil in the grounds of the hearts of the hearers, Lord Jesus. We are hungry for you tonight, Lord Jesus. We are thirsty for you tonight, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Amen. Thank you, music team, band members. Amen. If y'all will help me preach tonight, I'll make sure you guys can get to in and out before curfew is over. Is that fair? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Apostle Paul talks about the treasure in earthen vessels. If you study the context of what the treasure actually is, it could be a multitude of different things. We could uh, assume or guess or try to ascertain just by reading the scripture alone of what the treasure actually is. But when you study the context of 2 Corinthians, especially chapter 3, you know that Paul is talking about the ministry of the New Testament. He spends a lengthy period of time in the first half of first, uh, 2 Corinthians, rather, breaking down the superiority of the New Covenant. He talked about in the Old Covenant, under Moses, that God... Uh, spent time with Moses and in spending time with Moses, he revealed to him what we would call the law of Moses or uh, in particular, the Ten Commandments at that time. And through that interaction, Moses's face physically began to glow. But what we would think today as a wonderful thing, if one of you were in prayer for so long that you started to glow, I think we would jump and shout about that. We'd probably make an Instagram reel about it, you know, and Hey, we got glowing, we got glow in the dark Christians over here, you know? It wouldn't be something that we would necessarily push away, but because of their uh, their flesh and their unfamiliarness with spiritual things, that became something that they resisted. And Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 3 
that this new covenant, it's a better covenant because now we can look with open face into the glory of God. There's no veil that needs to cover our eyes when we come into the presence of God because in the Old Testament, there was not a sacrifice that was sufficient to take away their sins. So the Old Testament perspective of the glory of God was something to be afraid of. It was commonly understood that if you came in contact with God's presence that you would actually die. To us, that's such a foreign concept. Uh, but to them, because they were under the old covenant, they weren't able to experience the presence of God like we are able to experience it. And so when Paul is talking about the treasure in earthen vessels, uh, what he's talking about first and foremost uh, is the truth of the word of God. And he says, and, and he goes on to describe when you have the truth of God, you have the presence of God. So according to how much truth or revelation that you are revealed to is going to be the depth of the presence of God that you're going to experience. And that's why people of other particular denominations who we would believe don't have a full understanding of Jesus as God and the salvation message. They have a portion of what they would feel to be God. But there's something about when somebody has a revelation of the truth saved message the one God message and I preached it last week uh, and I'm going to continue to preach it because as a young adult generation we can't get so bent uh, on the things that make us excited uh, that we be we begin to betray the things that are powerful amen is anybody with me tonight all right and so Paul is saying when you have the truth of God you get the presence of God and I want to tell somebody, I, I understand having a prayer life is supremely important, but a lot of times I will pull people into, or people will come into my office and say, Pastor Morgan, I've been praying and I have not been able to feel God for a lengthy period of time when I pray. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many have ever felt that way before? You felt like you've gone to prayer. I will follow up with a question and I will say, well, how has your Bible reading been? And they say, well, Brother Morgan, that's the one area that I struggle in. And that's totally fine. But you have to understand that Bible reading and prayer are not separate experiences. The word of God is the fuel that you put into the tank. You can't just go into prayer and really just talk about whatever comes off the top of your head. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling God what you're thinking, but there's nothing that requires you to go into prayer and just make it up. But when you get into the word of God, you start to develop a burden for God's character and his nature. You start to read God's perspective on certain matters and talking about sin or talking about brotherly love or talking about worship. And when you take those things into prayer, you start to feel that that spiritual gas tank that you feel has been riding on E and you go into prayer and you just kind of putter in and out. But when you get the truth of God uh, inside of your bones, uh, there's something about the presence of God uh, that's soon going to follow. And that's why scripture teaches for where the spirit of the Lord is, uh, there is liberty. And what is liberty talking about in that passage? He's talking about what I mentioned before in the Old Testament. They weren't able to, to see the glory of God. They weren't able to to witness it because of the old covenant but in the new testament when you get the truth of god you get the presence of god and then when you get the presence of god you get the glory of god the glory of the presence of god can many times just be that goose bump you feel down your back it's really that demonstration. It's that feeling that you can't explain that I am somewhere in a dimension that is not of this world. I, I've stepped out of the, 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 the footsteps of earth and I've stepped into a, another realm. I can't see it with my eyes. I couldn't hear it with my ears, but I can feel it with my spirit. And if you've got the Holy Ghost, uh, you're very well acquainted with the presence of God. A lot of times we say it's goosebumps. It's, it's not really goosebumps, but sometimes I, I 
I think it could be the goosebumps that you feel. But really what it is, is you are recognizing that there's a being that's not of this world, uh, that is unseen. Uh, but scripture teaches in this passage later that the things that are seen are temporary. And it's the things that are unseen uh, that are eternal. So when you step in to the presence of God, it starts to bring perspective on your whole life. You get in the presence of God before you get in the presence of God. You're worried about the bills. You're worried about this. You're worried about where you're going to live. You're worried about uh, the, the drama that's in your dorm room or at your home. And you're worried about all these earthly temporal things. But there's something about stepping in to the presence of God that it begins to recalibrate your entire life. And what seemed important when you walked in doesn't seem so important when you walk out. If I'm being honest, there's many times I went into prayer with my to-do list with God and things I was worried about but all of a sudden that glory cloud it came into the building and it swept over me and what I was so consumed about and so worried about brother Devin a moment ago it's like the weight just lifted off of my shoulders why because I'm tapping in to those things that are unseen I'm tapping into the eternal things the things that are going to last forever the earth perisheth and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever the fashions of this world passeth away one thing I know is that I'm going to be on this earth for maybe 40 50 or 60 more years but I'm going to spend an eternity somewhere and I'm going to I got to make sure that I don't get so caught up in something that might all, and we're not even talking about things that will last a year we consume ourselves with things that will last minutes or even days, small things uh, that get our eyes off of the focus uh, that one day that there is a heaven to gain uh, and there's a hell to be resisted. Heaven and hell are still very real places. We do a lot of preaching about heaven, uh, but we don't do a lot, of, a lot of preaching about hell. Uh, and I want to make sure that I work out my salvation with fear and with trembling. Now, you can't just do that with your mental ingenuity alone. You can't just reason your way into, well, I'm just going to start caring about important things. And then all of a sudden, you just care about important things. There, there's something about the human mind. It's like it, 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 it is directed in one place. And it, I had this car before. It was uh, my old, I had an old Mustang before. I thought I was real cool, man. And my cousin crashed it, man. And I was, I was out and he borrowed it without asking me. Yeah, he borrowed it without asking me. And it was a drop-top convertible Mustang, man. 5.0, the thing was fast, man. And I was really, some of you remember this car. And I remember my cousin crashed it, and I was so angry. And my stepdad put this car back together for me. I mean, it was totally, put it back together. And one thing that I remembered about the car is that if you just left the steering wheel to its own devices, you are going to run off into the abyss somewhere. I mean, you're going into the ditch every single time. So something I had to learn about that steering wheel is I had to hold it like 30, 40 degrees to the left just so I could drive straight. It was ghetto, man. And who's ever had a ghetto car before? I don't think you could be used by God if at one point in time you didn't have a ghetto car, man. There's just so much spiritual truth about ghetto cars, you know? And uh, I, I had like three or four ghetto cars, man. I, f I think I upgraded after that, hopefully. But, um, and that's so, that's so much the nature of the flesh. It's resident position. If you leave your flesh to its own devices and you don't keep your hands on the steering wheel, it is going to automatically start veering you off of a track. That's why Paul says, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, he says, I don't even give an occasion to the flesh because I understand that if I give my flesh just one inch, I'm no longer going to drive on the straight and narrow anymore. And that's why Jesus gives us the wonderful image when he says, why? 
wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You don't find the path of eternal life by accident. You don't find the path of eternal life just by wandering through and seeing what happens. But it's by careful, diligent study. I'm going to hold myself to this narrow road. My flesh is going to want to veer off, but I have to do something. And that is done through the presence of God. This is why Paul says that we do mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. He lays this wonderful foundation in the book of Romans for why we can't live for God. It's physically impossible to live for God by any other way but through the spirit. It's the only way to conquer the flesh. And we really misinterpret a passage pretty drastically in Romans chapter 7 when Paul says, this is probably the most misinterpreted passage I've ever heard. When Paul says in Romans 7, those things that I do, I do not. You, you know what I'm talking about. He's talking about the things I want to do, I don't end up doing. And he says the things I want to do, I don't, you know, I don't end up doing. But the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And we're like, well, see, Paul, uh, he couldn't control his flesh either. So I'm just going to act buck wild all the time, you know. It got, just got real quiet in here. Amen. And so you have to understand the context of that passage. Paul is talking about living under the law. In Romans chapter 7, he was saying, under the law, I'm not able to control my flesh. Under the law, my flesh was too powerful. But when I received the Holy Ghost, God gave me a power to stand against the forces of darkness, to stand against this wicked flesh, and to say, I will not be drawn away to the lust of this world, but through the power of the Holy Ghost. Some of you, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, have lowered your expectation on what you believe the Holy Ghost can do in your life. You've convinced yourself that you're always going to be in sin. You're always going to be a screw up. You're always going to be a mess up. But friend, if you've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you, it says that the flesh warreth against the spirit. But I've got good news. The spirit is warring against the flesh. And every single day I get up and I realize I'm in a war. I'm in a battle. And I've got to, I've got a fight to, uh, to face. And if I don't fight it, my flesh is going to start veering off. I need some of y'all to wake up tonight huh, because there's a war going on for your spirit right now huh, and you've got to understand huh, that it's through the power of the word of God. Huh, it's through the power of the presence of God. Huh, you get the word of God. Huh, you'll get the presence of God. Huh, you get the presence of God. Huh, you'll get the glory of God. And so this treasure, it's the, it's the truth of the word of God and the treasure has been manifested in different ways all throughout time. From the beginning of time, Adam and Eve walked with God. There, there wasn't much revealed truth in the garden that we know of. But truth started to be, is the fullness of time. Really, the, the fullness of our experience with God was not in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was always going to turn out bad. Because man still did not have the ability to resist sin. So I know we give Adam and Eve a, a bad time, you know. Like I remember being a kid and really getting bent out of shape with Adam, you know. Like how weird is that? You, you got to be a Pentecostal kid growing up in church to be like seven years old and you're like yelling at Adam, you know. Like that's like sad, you know what I mean. Like I was seven, eight years old, mad at Adam, you know, because he ate of the fruit and screwed everything else up for us, you know. It's on my, it used to get on my nerves. But you have to understand that if, if we, any of us would have been in that position, we would have eventually made the same mistake as Adam. Because our flesh was not able to resist the power of sin. That's why Jesus had to come, die on the cross, fill us with his spirit, that we could overcome the power of sin through his spirit. And so it's been revealed all throughout time. And then... God revealed the spirit in part in the Old Testament uh, and to men like Abraham. And Abraham walked with God and he revealed uh, uh, some powerful truths about God. The, the first revelation we really see in the Old Testament uh, is, was the revelation of holiness. And people think that holiness 
uh, is the last thing when you get into the kingdom of God. Friend, holiness is not the last thing when you get into the kingdom of God. We, we make a big mistake, and I know this might, ben, I'm, this might mess up some of y'all's paradigm, but we make a big mistake when we say holiness is the last thing or the last part of when you get into the kingdom of God. We're so worried that people are going to be offended by our separation from the world that we tuck it under the corner and we hide it under the couch. And, you know, if they're at the house for a couple weeks, they'll say, hey, what's this thing under the couch? Oh, that's holiness. Let me tell you about that. Uh, you know, it, and then we kind of, well, you got to get the revelation of it. The Bible says in the New and Old Testament, God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I will, he says, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Before God gave us the revelation of the oneness of God through Moses, before God gave us the revelation of, the, uh, of baptism and, and the Holy Ghost infilling in its fullest sense, uh, the first revelation that we get was in Genesis uh, with Abraham when he says, I want you to come out from the Chaldeans. I want you to come out uh, from a sinful world. Uh, and if you will come out, uh, I've got riches uh, and I've got treasures forevermore. Uh, I've got something for you uh, that you can never imagine I'm going to make you a man that's going to his name is going to be known all throughout time I'm going to make your seed like the stars of the heavens and out of your seed a redeemer is going to come but before Abraham could have that experience he had to separate himself and this is the doctrine of repentance just in general before you receive the Holy Ghost before you can receive the salvation experience, you have to first what? Turn away. Come out. Be separate. Y'all hear me preach about repentance a lot huh? because I believe if you don't get it, huh? you can't get any other doctrine. Huh? You can't just make Jesus your buddy. You can't just make Jesus uh, your best friend. Huh? You've got to turn away from the sin and the wickedness uh, of the world huh? and say, God, huh? I leave. And repentance is more than just saying sorry and feeling bad. Huh? It's changing your perspective. Huh? I'm not going to live huh, in the world any longer. Huh? I'm not going to live like the world. I'm not going to act like the world. Huh? I'm I'm not going to talk like the world. And I don't know if young adults think this is popular or not, but I know it's biblical. The Bible says when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back for a bride that's without spot and without blemish. You can stare at me if you want, but I believe it's true. The bride he's going to come back is not going to be a bride that's tainted by the filth of the world, doesn't smell like the world, doesn't act like the world, doesn't sound like the world. He's coming for a bride that is unspotted by the world. We're not talking just about sin. We're talking about influence. And so the closer I get to God, the, the more I stop caring about heaven and hell issues. And what is this going to keep me saved or not? I'm more worried about God when you come back. Are you going to see me without spot? Are you going to see me without blemish? Lord, I don't want to be tainted by the world. There's a reason I, I turned off the news media a long time ago. Because I'll get into all that. I'll get caught up with what all the conservatives people are saying uh, and it'll get all wrapped up in my mind uh, but I'm going to tell you uh, I don't want to be spotted by the world uh, and the world doesn't just look like Cardi B and the world doesn't just look like Lil Wayne uh, the world can look like Ben Shapiro the world can look like Andrew Tate uh, I don't want those people speaking into my worldview. Uh, I don't want those people telling me uh, how I'm supposed to live uh, how I'm supposed to act uh, you know what I want uh, I want to crack this Bible open uh, every single morning uh, and and say, God, teach me how to think. Teach me how to talk. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to walk. Tell me what I need to resist. I'm concerned that a few more of you aren't preaching with me right now. I don't know if you're tired. I don't know if, it, if you've been so, uh, your mind has been so melted by media. But let me tell you, holiness is not a sideshow of the kingdom of God. He said, if I'm going to receive you, you got to come out from among them. He didn't say you had to be perfect. 
He didn't say uh, that you would never make mistakes. Uh, but uh, he says that light hath no fellowship with darkness. Uh, he says no man uh, can serve two masters. Uh, because either you're going to love one uh, and you're going to hate the other. Uh, I've seen a lot of Christians that dress the right way, look the right way, talk the right way. Uh, but every time they walked into church, uh, they had a sour look on their face. Uh, because they're trying to serve two masters. Uh, and they're hating one ministry. Uh, become cumbersome to them. Uh, they're tired they're weary they're always getting offended they're always getting burnt out uh, because they're trying to serve two masters uh, but no man uh, you no man can drink out of two fountains uh, you can't mix sweet and bitter water together uh, just one drop of the poison of this world uh, is enough to dilute an entire spirit uh, so I'm praying God let my spirit be unspotted let my spirit be untainted God God's not telling us that we when he talks about separation uh, He's not talking about uh, 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 just isolating yourself. Uh, the most famous passage, or excuse me, uh, one of the most famous uh, axioms concerning holiness. We say it all the time. We're not in this world. Or we're not of this world. We're in the world, but not of the world. Why did that take me so long to get, man? It's so famous. Oh, yeah. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. But what I'm particularly concerned about is people who are of the world, but are not in the world. Meaning there's people that you isolate yourself to the church. You don't, you don't get out of your church bubble. You might never leave this CLC campus. You're not of the world. You never come in contact with a sinner. You never talk to a sinner. You never get to rub shoulders with people out in the world. But your heart is so torn away from the presence of God that you're of the world, but you're not in the world. And I understand that it's a, there's an importance. And I've been reading about this. This is the direction I want to go. Is in the end of the book of Kings. Is kind of where I'm at my studies. If you heard my preachings, I've been a lot in Kings. And a lot of these sermons just come in the overflow of my daily reading. And I just read and I hear God speaking. So that's why you hear me in the book of Kings a lot lately. Because I've been reading through it. And, and towards the end of the book, uh, Israel had just committed such whoredoms and such sins. Uh, through the king Manasseh in particular. I mean, it was bad. The point, it got so bad, Brother Brian, that it says that the people of Israel got worse than the pagan people they drove out in the first place. Like God looked at his people and says, you're not as bad as worldly people. You are worse than worldly people. And God said, I'm, I'm fed up with this. And so he raised up a king named Nebuchadnezzar that came against the nation of Judah. And the Bible says, you can read it in, towards the end of Kings and towards the end of Chronicles, that Nebuchadnezzar warred against Judah for two years. Or, or it was a year and some months. And he wasn't able to besiege the land. And he, he kept going after them. Then he kind of changed his tactics a little bit. Rather than trying to fight them in a ranged battle, Scripture says that he directed all his attention towards their wall. He got his catapults out. He said, we're not going to try to fight long range anymore, but we're going to try to break down the barriers uh, that keep us from fighting close range. And the Bible says that the moment he broke down their walls, uh, it was only a matter of days uh, before the entire nation was swept into captivity. And the enemy wants to convince you that this long range battle is too weary. The Bible says that a famine developed in the land because of the battle. They got so hungry and they got so tired and they got so weary that they stopped defending their walls. They stopped defending the very thing that kept the enemy from coming in close proximity to them. And through their weariness, they allowed their walls to be destroyed. And what was a two year battle capitulated in only a couple of months. And there's certain times where we battle and then all of a sudden a certain app will get downloaded on our phone. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You fight with loneliness. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. I want everyone to close their eyes. You fight loneliness. I didn't think of this before I got here. I feel this in the Holy Ghost. You fight loneliness for so long, two, three years, that eventually it gets so wearisome that you go to the app store and all of a sudden 
you see Tinder on your homepage. You see a dating app on your homepage. You start sliding into DMs you shouldn't slide into. And what was a battle of loneliness for two and three years, instantly within days, notifications start coming in. Messages start coming in. The ball starts to roll. And you thought that it would take the same path uh, that it did before. Uh, but it swept you so quickly that only in a matter of days, the enemy has completely took refuge in your mind. I want you to lift your hands right now. Just begin to talk to the Lord right now. I want to tell someone right now, don't give up the battle of purity. Don't give up the battle of holiness. Don't give up the battle to be unspotted from the world. You might have made a mistake. You might have fallen down. But you run back to the foot of the cross. And I want to tell you right now that there's still hope at the foot of the cross. He called Thank you, Jesus. There's a wonderful spirit of God. I'm just going to go for just a few more minutes and then we're going to pray. And, and the Babylonian captivity, they were people. They were the people of God. They struggled with idolatry for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they were taken captive. The, the sons of God, the people of God. And they served a pagan king in his own land for 70 years. And in the 50th year of the 70th year, a king named Cyrus uh, the Bible says at the end of Chronicles and the beginning of Ezra that the spirit of the Lord moved on him strongly. Basically, God was saying enough is enough. My people have been in captivity long enough. I'm going to send them back into their home. And Cyrus wrote a decree that the people are going to go back and he was going to personally fund the rebuilding of their temple in their city. Because when the, when the Babylonians came in through Nebuchadnezzar, they completely wiped out the majority of the city. It was just in absolute absolute rubble the temple of God where the presence of God dwelt was completely destroyed and Cyrus said you're going to go back and you're going to rebuild this temple and the Israelites went back and they were excited and over a period of two years they laid the foundation of the temple and the Bible says that the young men shouted for joy but the old men wept because they remembered the glory of the old temple and how good it used to be but the young men were like man we never had a temple before so we're just excited we got something you know and and they shouted over the foundation of this temple and and, and the Samaritan people that were, were birthed the Samaritans were the Jewish women married uh, Babylonian men and created a mixed breed and the Israelites hated them because they were seen as compromisers and the Samaritan men that dwelled in the land said hey we want to help you build this temple now we want we've seen God move among the people we want to be a part of this and they drew a line in the sand they said no you you can't be a part of this we're going to build this on our own well the Samaritan people got really upset and they started writing to the new king that was there it was no longer Cyrus a man named Artaxerxes and they write to Artaxerxes and say, hey, these people are a wicked and rebellious people. If you allow them to rebuild this temple, it's going to be really bad for you. And the king freaks out, writes a decree and says, don't build the temple anymore. And what happened was that the foundation was laid that they shouted about. It went undeveloped for 16 years after that. And this is where a, a prophet named Haggai comes on the scene and he, he's vexed in his spirit because he sees that the, the foundation of the temple is laid and the people started to divert their attention. No longer are they building uh, the house of God or the work of God. They don't have concern for the presence of God anymore. Now they, what, what they're doing is building their own houses. And Haggai the prophet tells the people, how can you build your own houses when the house of God lays in waste? 
commanded the people, if you take care of God's needs, and they were having all these issues. He says, you sow and you, you don't have enough food to eat. You collect money and it's like there's holes in your bags. It just keeps falling out because when you live for yourself, it just seems like there's never enough to go around. You can make, I know people that make six figures, $200,000 a year, and it's like they always got a need. They never have enough money. They're never happy. They're always sick in their body. But I've seen good saints of God that took pay cuts and only made a couple dollars an hour but they were doing the work of God and I've known that they have everything that they need I want to tell you that your value is not based by how much you make or how much is in your bank account people are thoroughly convinced that you will live a higher quality of life if you make six figures or two hundred thousand dollars a year I promise you if you're out of alignment with with God it doesn't matter how much money you make you'll never be truly satisfied and people that come in alignment with Matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness all these things shall be added unto you and so this is what was going on. And so they rebuilt the temple and they, they continue. And it was a great thing. And they continued to be attacked by the enemy. And the next book over, a man named Nehemiah said, you know what? We have we, we've resurfaced the, the, the temple, the representation of the presence of God in our life. He said, but we have this issue. We have never rebuilt the walls that used to protect us. We never rebuilt the barrier that kept the enemy out of close proximity in our life. Because it's one thing for the enemy to attack you from afar, but it's another thing for the enemy to attack you right in front of your face or right next to your ear. You have to be very careful of the atmospheres you get into. You have to be very careful of the things you watch. You have to be very careful of the things you listen to. You have to be very careful of the people that you let around you. Because they could be the very forces uh, that Satan will enhance or possess uh, to spiritually spear you uh, and attack you. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, I don't want to give the enemy one opportunity to get a foothold in my life. And so Nehemiah goes through this project of rebuilding the temple. Excuse me, the walls. And the walls were in absolute desolation. They were in rubble. And the pagan people around them were would begin to mock them they said there's no way that you're going to rebuild these walls he said they said if a fox were to run over your walls they would completely crumble but in a matter of 56 days something that should have taken them years and years and years to complete they completed in 56 days it's nothing short of a miracle there are some commentators that said it was like an invisible crane would pick up large stones and they would just travel in the air and find their position and you have to understand that they weren't just building. These were just people that just got out of slavery. The Bible says that they had a shovel in one hand and they had a sword in another hand. So while they were building the walls, they had to fight off the attacking enemy. In a matter of 56 days, God gave the people of Israel the grace to rebuild the protective barrier in their life. So this lets me know that if God will go through great lengths to rebuild walls, so much show that it's one of the most significant miracles uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, I think God cares uh, about the atmospheres that I allow myself into. Uh, I think God cares uh, about the, 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 the barriers that I place in my life uh, so that sinful influences uh, aren't able to intrude and destroy. And in the end of the book, I wish it would just end there. You know, Nehemiah tries to revive the people of Israel. He reads the entire law to them. And it's a really interesting story. You read the book of Nehemiah and, and he's really trying to turn their hearts back towards God. But at the end of the book, after all the walls were built and the city was rebuilt, Nehemiah goes back into the temple and the place where the presence of God should be dwelling. The place where the glory cloud would descend. This was our meeting place with God. This is where we would encounter the presence of God. It was desolate and the people were lacking on their duties and what they were doing for God. They got so consumed with building walls and building barriers that they forgot the reason that they built the barriers in the first place. 
And there's no reason to build barriers or walls if there's nothing to protect. There's no reason to have standards and holiness and all of these things if we're not protecting something. We don't get out from the world just so we can be different. We don't get out from the world just so we can be isolated. But we understand that when I cleanse myself of sin, that there's a holy God that's going to say, I want you to come on into my presence. I want you to experience me. Paul says this. He says, if Christ did not rise from the dead, we are of men most miserable. If Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead and that we don't have any resurrection power in our life, this is the most miserable life that you could possibly live. Why is that? Because we're denying our flesh. We're telling our flesh no. We're not doing what the flesh is telling us to do. At the end of the day, there's no reason. There's no resurrection power. The reason I tell my flesh no is because what I get in return is so much more powerful. And it's so much more mighty. And so I want to remind someone, you might have grown up in church and your skirt might be down to the floor. Your collar might be up to your ears. You you might never watch a movie in your life uh, and you've got all the holiness standards uh, that you could ever want uh, but if you don't have uh, the glory uh, and the resurrection power uh, living inside of you uh, that's not a life worth living uh, I'm telling you the reason we separate from the world uh, is because God responds to a people who are separate uh, he responds to a people that say God I want more of your presence uh, more than I want the, the things of the world God, I want to be entertained with your presence more than I want the things of the world. And so this is why I deny. This is why I deny my flesh. I don't deny my flesh for the sake of feeling bad. I'm not a sadist. I'm not somebody who enjoys pain. I'm not somebody who enjoys feeling disgruntled. But I understand that this flesh wants to drive me away from a holy God. So I tell this flesh, no. I, I, I say, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm not going to watch those things. It's not difficult for me to not watch R-rated movies. It's not difficult for me to wa not watch X-rated things because I'm not doing it not just to not do it, but I'm doing it because I understand that I have a meeting time and a meeting place with the holy presence of God. And I want to tell you, if you get into that special place where the glory comes down, I don't understand Christians who are bored when they go to prayer and they're bored when they come to church. I want to tell you, it's the greatest honor in the world to be in the presence of God. Brother Hernandez, there's nothing like going to the Lord in the wee morning hours uh, and you just feel uh, that he's been waiting for you there uh, and he touches you uh, friend I want to tell you uh, be holy, uh, be separate uh, be modest, uh, don't watch bad things uh, but understand why you're doing that uh, and why you're building those walls uh, is because you are protecting a treasure uh, that's in this earthen vessel uh, what I have inside of me uh, I don't want to be tainted uh, I don't want it to be affected uh, but I want it to be pure uh, because I want to be pure in the eyes of my God. Would you lift your hands and worship him right now? Hallelujah. I'm calling on somebody that there be a fresh reminder and a fresh revelation of just how valuable what you have inside of you is. Maybe you haven't tapped into it for a little while, but I want to tell you right now, people that come, there are people that come to church and see our ladies wearing long dresses and our men doing this. And we talk about not watching that and doing that. And they say, I don't want to do all those rules. And I'm not for all of those rules, but let me tell you, friend, if you get a revelation of relationship, if you get a 
revelation of the presence of God. Listen to me right now. Rules without relationship is ridiculous. I want to tell you, it doesn't make any sense uh, to separate yourself. uh, And there's nothing waiting for you on the other side. Uh, The reason I do all this uh, is because there's a holy God. Uh, Listen to me. Jesus says uh, a parable. Uh, He says the kingdom of heaven is likened into a treasure in the midst of a field. And when you find that treasure, you sell all that you have that you might obtain it. He says there's another parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a pearl of great price. And when you find this pearl, it doesn't matter what you've got in your bank account. It doesn't matter what relationships you've built up to that point. It doesn't matter what kind of uh, earthly acuity that you have. You see that this pearl, it's so valuable. I don't care about anything other. I don't care about anything other than obtaining this pearl. Let me tell you, that pearl of great price, that treasure in the midst of the field is a man named Jesus Christ. Friend, if you ever really get to know Jesus, I know you've been raised in church. You've been coming and doing this thing your whole life but he's a lot more than a stained glass on a catholic church he's a lot more than a storybook character he's a lot more than an old guy or an old prophet that we preach about i want to tell you you ever get to know this jesus there's so many times brother elijah i went into prayer feeling discouraged i went into prayer feeling discouraged feel like I couldn't make it, feel like I couldn't go another day, wanted to throw in the towel. And at the other side, there was a master. Had his arms wide open. I said, Lord, I messed up. He said, come on in, son. Come on in, son, let me hold you. So many times I was full of fear. Didn't know what was gonna happen tomorrow. Didn't know what was going to happen in my life. I want to tell you a master. A master named Jesus Christ. He spread out two nail scarred hands. And just like old doubt in Thomas. Sometimes I had to say Lord. I believe but help me my unbelief. He said Morgan here's the nail sprints in my hands. I remember being a young boy, earliest memories I have in my life, six years old, five years old. Uh, I didn't care about anything else. Uh, But as a six-year-old boy, uh, that presence of God would sweep over me, and I would weep, and I would cry at six years old. And I don't know if this is weird to some of y'all. Maybe it is. uh, But every once in a while, uh, I go back in the recesses of my mind, uh, and I go back to that six-year-old boy who didn't have any other cares uh, and any other worries. Uh, He wasn't worried about pastor in a ministry. He wasn't worried about paying bills. He wasn't worried about the economy. He wasn't worried about all the things going on. All he worried about was getting to know this wonderful man named Jesus who filled him with his spirit at six years old. Every once in a while, I just crawl up in the lap of Jesus. And it's not formal these and thous. It's just, Lord, I need you today. And I want to tell you right now, what I feel in those prayer meetings, I genuinely mean this with all of my heart. I wouldn't trade it for every dime in the world I wouldn't trade it for riches I wouldn't trade it for a two hour rated R movie because the Bible says he's a holy God and with a holy God there's certain things I can't engage in listen to me some of you God revealed this to me earlier today some of you live in your relationship with God it is a repentance only relationship The only time you feel the presence of God is after you've made a series of mistakes uh, and you repent and you feel the mercy of God and the mercy of God feels wonderful. But let me tell you, friend, there's a lot more to God than just his mercy. There's a lot more to God than just those moments of reconciliation. Uh, There's waking up the next day uh, and the next day and the next day. uh, And yeah, you might make a few mistakes on the road, uh, but you're not, you're not begging for mercy all the time. Uh, You're saying, Lord, I want to get to know you today. Uh, Let's talk about some things today. Uh, I want you to show me some things today. Uh, And I prayed prayers like this, brother Cade. Uh, I'd say, God, break my heart for what breaks your heart. God, I want to see this world like you see it. Uh, 
and all of a sudden I'd leave that prayer meeting and I'd see an old homeless man on the street and usually I'd just pass that old dude by but something that day caught my heart I felt like I caught the heart of God that day and I'd say Lord let my heart love what your heart loves and I'll see some of y'all worship and some of y'all dance and some of y'all praise I watch some of y'all run the aisles and I start crying and weeping uncontrollably watching you get your breakthrough because just because I, I think I got a little bit of the inside of the heart of God when I see you standing out in faith I wouldn't trade that for the world I don't want to watch bad things I don't want to talk about bad things I don't want to be a shady person because what I get in return church we got to be a holy people we got to be a separate people we've got to be unspotted by the world but you want to know You want to know why we have to be unspotted by the world? Because there's a marriage supper of the Lamb that we have to attend. I've got a place at the marriage supper right next to Jesus Christ. I've had a vision in my life more times than I can count that there's going to be one day. I, I, I believe I spoke on it a little bit last week. I'm going to take my last step on this earth. I'm going to tell you this is a real vision I've had multiple times. I, I, I would be in my living room and I'd be vacuuming. I don't know. I don't ever vacuum. I don't know why I'm vacuuming in this vision. It must be a miracle. Amen. And I'm vacuuming in this vision. And all of a sudden, I push my last vacuum. And all of a sudden, I could see myself floating up into heaven. And it's just a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And all of a sudden, I'm there. And I start to see all some of the family members that I've lost. Uh, and some of the loved ones that I've lost. Uh, and I look for them. Uh, and I, it's good to see you. They come to greet me at the gate. Uh, oh, it's good to see you, friend. It's good to see you, Grandma. It's good to see you, brother, that I lost. Oh, Bishop, I loved you, Bishop. You, you meant a lot to me, Elder. Thank you, Elder. But just give me a second. Because i got to find the one that's died for my sins. i got to find the one that wrapped me in his arms a million a million a million times over I'm telling you old Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver I'm telling you I wouldn't trade him for all of the world so you have to understand holiness friend holiness makes no sense I said it earlier rules without relationship is ridiculous but listen relationship without rules is repulsive you don't get in a loving relationship with a husband or a wife and that there is no boundaries with the opposite sex it's repulsive this is big thing it, it, it's absolutely repulsive in our generation I'm so sorry you have to struggle with this where it's popular today to have what's called an open marriage that's repulsive in the eyes of God it's repulsive that one man could be married to a woman and think that it's okay to sleep with multiple other women that's repulsive the reason I am separate is because I belong to somebody. I've made a commitment with him. I'm married to him in the spirit. And I'm not going to turn my back on the person who has been so good to me. Who has loved me with an everlasting love. And so I'm calling on a lifeline young adult generation to step out of a repentance only mode. Come out from among them. Some of you are going to have to go back into your rooms. You're going to have, I wish we had a good old bonfire service right now where we got the trash can out. We throwed some DVDs and some video games and some board games and say, Lord, I'm not worried about heaven and hell. I'm not worried about uh, 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 any of that, but I'm worried. God, this is a prayer I've prayed in my life. Reveal anything to me that keeps me one inch from your presence God reveal anything to me if it keeps me back let me know and I'll throw it away and you know sometimes he does sometimes he says hey did you realize that that was there I said oh Jesus I didn't it wasn't sin it wasn't even a sinful thing it was just something that was consuming me something that would get me aggravated something that would get me upset and it was distracting me brother Hernandez from really understanding why God created me in the first place and that was to walk with him. And he's not going to change his nature. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He's a pure God. And he's asking that we would be a righteous, holy, 
and pure people. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? I feel a sweet presence of God sweeping in the building right now. I want to tell you the perpetual prayer of my heart. God, it's not a, it's not a complicated prayer. It's not an articulate prayer. But it's the cry of my heart. God, I want to know you. I'm telling you right now, whether I succeed as being a lifeline pastor or not, whether I exceed as a Bible college instructor, if I make any, any type of riches, if I, if I have any type of nice commodities on this earth, it doesn't matter to me. The one thing I cannot fail, with, fail at is I've got to get to know my Savior. And there's something I've learned about God. You've heard me say it before. It's the first message I ever preached to the lifeline. It was at our prayer retreat. There's something about the presence of God. David said, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. You ever feel that? My flesh. Sometimes I pray and I begin to shake. Because my flesh long, I'm not, I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm not trying to put on a show. But my, I could feel it in my body. My flesh yearns. It yearns for a touch of God. It yearns to be in his presence. David said to see thy glory and thy power. So that I have seen in the sanctuary. Because your loving kindness is better than life. Friend, if you have a hard time praying, if you really have a hard time giving things up, really, if you really have a hard time deleting and, and all that and being holy and stepping out, I just encourage you, get alone in his presence. Get to know him. He's more than just an invisible God in the ceiling. The Bible says he's a very present help. He's a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. He's as close as the mention of his name. I said it to someone earlier. How do I feel the presence of God? I asked him, have you surrendered? Have you given it all up? Have you laid it at the feet of Jesus? There's something about turning away that rich young ruler. It plagues me sometimes. Jesus looked at him. He said, I want you to follow me. I've got some stuff for you. I want to make you an apostle. I want to make you a great man of God. The rich young ruler knew the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord. He knew it all. And he said this, well, thou art very close. But one thing that thou lackest. Just one little tiny thing, just a little bit. Just small. I want you to go and sell everything that you have. Because when you have an eternal perspective when you've got an eternal perspective of heaven selling all that you have compared to what you get in return probably didn't make sense to that rich young ruler because he turned around said he was exceedingly sorrowful because he had many things 
But when you've got an eternal perspective and you know Jesus and you know what he can do in your life and you know what a daily relationship and walk with him, hearing his voice, the closeness of his touch, the warmth of his spirit, the safety in his blood, the assurity in his word, selling all that I have, every piece of furniture, car, appliances, it would be a small thing to get in return to get to know Jesus. I invite you all to stand tonight. Wonderful touch of God that's here tonight. Would you lift your hands? Building walls are important. Keeping the enemy out from close proximity. I've mentioned it. There are just certain things that do not belong in an apostolic's home. There are certain shows that we just should not watch. Period. Whether it's R-rated or not. Because those very things cause there to be atmospheric friction. God's like, I don't feel welcome in that type of atmosphere. I'm going to take a step back. So walls are important. But most importantly, remember what you're protecting. You've got a treasure in this earthen vessel. Protect that treasure. Buy the truth and sell it not. It's not worth it. There's no price tag on my relationship with God. There's no price tag. You've got, to, you've got to make that resolute in your spirit. There's no price tag on the presence of God. I won't do it for ministry. I won't do it for busyness. I won't do it for a girl. I won't do it for a guy. It's not for sale. I'm, I'm done. You can do whatever you want. You want to come down to the front, find a place to pray, kneel on your seat. But would you make that commitment to the Lord one more time? Lord Jesus, I want you more than I want anything else. Lord, I'll give up what I got to give up. I'll turn away what I got to turn away. But I want relationship with you, God.